Widows and orphans have always had a special place in God's heart. This means they should also have a special place in the life and heart of the church. Welcome to Every Last Word, a radio and internet program with Dr. Philip Ryken, teaching the whole Bible to change your whole life. God is the God of the needy, and He is so because He loves to provide for those who cannot help themselves. Well, Phil, today we're going to see yet another miracle God accomplished through his prophet Elisha. Why do you believe that God has put so many stories of miraculous provision in the Bible for us to read? Well, Mark, we get a lot of really practical lessons from this family. One is just the importance of having a life of godliness. The husband who died in this family was a godly man and will be encouraged by his example of faithfulness to God and encouraged to see the way that God met the needs of his family. We also see the importance of providing for the practical needs of our families. That's an important biblical responsibility that we have before God to do everything in our power to provide for the people that we're, uh, that we're related to. And beyond that, of course, we've got a spiritual family and we have an obligation to one another to meet practical needs within the family of God. So what are you hoping that we'll carry away from this story and, and from this family? Mark, I think if you look at the biblical miracles, many of them, most of them, are designed to prove the truth of God's word. How do we know that Elijah and Elisha really are true prophets from God? Well, they're able to perform powerful miracles. But many times there's also a secondary or additional lesson that we can learn from the miracle. And then today's story from the Bible is a good example of that. We're going to meet a family that's in a very desperate situation. And many people that are listening may be able to relate to their situation. It's a family where there's been a death in the family. A woman has been left without her husband. She is in debt. And humanly speaking, she has no way to meet her daily needs. That's the situation they're in. Thank you, Phil. Let's turn in our Bibles now to Second Kings chapter 4 and listen to God's Word for us today. When I was in seminary, a horror story was passed from one student to another along the hallways and into the secret corners of the campus. Research shows, my classmates whispered, that the demographic individual most likely to end up in a mental institution is a minister's wife who lives in a manse adjacent to a church. Now, that may have been a myth, but then we weren't in any hurry to go home and tell our wives about it either. We kind of kept it to ourselves. And it was served as a sort of warning that there are easier things to do in life than to be married to a minister. Now, the woman who came to Elisha at the beginning of Second Kings chapter 4 had lived a hard life, and it was partly because her husband had been in the ministry. He was one of the 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed his knee to Baal. And since he was a prophet in those days, he had undergone several waves of persecution by the wicked queen Jezebel. And very likely, there were times when he had to leave his family behind and go into hiding. Perhaps he was even one of those 100 prophets who are mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 18, whom Obadiah hid in caves and fed with bread and water. His wife had now become a widow. After all the burdens of ministry and the trials of persecution, as we read in verse 1, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. The debts have been piling up, and apparently, like many men in the ministry, this man was not exactly a financial genius. His legacy has been exhausted, and the creditors are banging on the door, and the widow's worst fears are about to be realized. She is about to lose custody of her children. She must sell her sons into slavery to work off her debts. Who is to blame for this woman's troubles? Well, perhaps the prophet himself is to blame. After all, it is the responsibility of a husband and a father to provide for his family. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, Proverbs 13, verse 22. And the fact that this man is a prophet is no excuse. 
Serving God in the ministry and serving God in the home are not in opposition. A man must care for his family as well as for his congregation. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy chapter 5. He's worse than an unbeliever because he ought to know better. By failing to provide for his children, he brings God's name and God's ministry into disrepute. Well, although the prophet himself may deserve part of the blame, his neighbors deserve most of it. Because this man was a prophet and a man of God, he was entitled to receive material help from the people of Israel. It is the responsibility of God's people to care for the needs of God's servant. And there's a good example of that later in this chapter, and we'll read about it next week. The Shunammite woman builds a small room for Elisha on her roof so that he has a place to stay. And someone should have taken care of this other prophet in the same way. The fact that his sons were about to be sold into slavery exposes a society which did not respect the ministry of God's Word. The Lord is honored whenever a church provides for the needs of its pastors and its missionaries and also for their children. And so this widow's needs should have been met already, either by her own husband or by her neighbors. And yet, sadly, no one took care of her. She was destitute. She had nowhere to turn except to the Lord. And when she did so, she learned three great lessons about the providence of God. And the first is the most obvious. God meets our daily needs. When the widow needed help, God provided for her and for her sons in a miraculous way. At the beginning of the story, Elisha was not sure what to do. And so he began by assessing the widow's needs and finding out what resources she had at her disposal. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? And this is a good model for diaconal work. Elisha is willing to help, and yet he is careful to wait until he knows for certain what kind of help is required. Before you can help someone, you must know what they need and what they have. Unfortunately, this woman did not have very much. Your servant has nothing at home at all, she said except a little oil. Literally, what she says is that she has except only a flask of oil. And yet Elisha thinks big. He tells her to go to all her neighbors and borrow as much and as many clay jars as she can. Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Apparently, God is going to set this woman up in the oil business. And so she does as she was told. She goes around the neighborhood with her recycling bucket, and she gathers as many jars as she can find, fat jars and thin jars, ugly jars and beautiful jars, coarse jars and delicate jars. She leaves Elisha, and she goes into her home with all the jars, and she shuts the door behind her sons. And then as we read in verse 5, they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. It was a miracle. It was amazing. The widow would pour one jar right up to the brim, and then there would be another to replace it, and she would fill that one and then another one after that. The widow kept Pouring, and the more that she poured, the more oil came out. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. Now you may know that oil was like liquid money in those days. So this widow was rich. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. The family now had enough to pay off all their debts and to live off the rest 
of the proceeds, God met all their daily needs. We should notice that this widow acted in faith. It was a great act of faith to go to all her neighbors and ask for empty jars, trusting that they would be filled. It was a great act of faith to begin to pour that oil, trusting that there would be enough to go around. It was an act of faith also to begin by paying off her debts, and only then to rely on the Lord for the provision of everything else that she needed. This widow trusted in the providence of God, and when she did, she found him to be completely trustworthy. If you trust in God for your own needs, you will find that God will provide out of his great providence. If you are God's child, then my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. If you need clothes, God will provide clothing. If you need food, God will give you the food that you need. If you need shelter, he will supply shelter. If you need employment, you will find as you turn to him in faith that God will give you something useful to do. God always meets the needs of his children. The second lesson to learn from the miracle of the jars of oil is that God cares for widows. Almost the first thing we learn about this woman is that her husband is deceased. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out, Your servant, my husband, is dead. The woman comes to Elisha in all of the grief and in all of the poverty and in all of the distress and loneliness and vulnerability of her widowhood. We discover as we read the Bible that throughout, God displays his heart for widows. Do not take advantage of a widow, he commands in his law. The Lord, your God, Deuteronomy chapter 10, defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. Psalm 146, the Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. And since God cares for widows in this way, he expects his people to care for widows. In fact, the whole economic system of ancient Israel was set up in their favor. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, when you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, don't go back to get it, leave it for the fatherless and the widow so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Again, when you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, don't go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. God also instructed his people to tithe so that there would be food for the fatherless and the widow so that they would come to the towns and eat and be satisfied. Therefore, those who take care of widows, as God commands, receive God's blessing. You may remember that the deacons in the early church in Jerusalem were first initiated in order to care for widows. The Apostle James goes so far as to say that caring for widows is the very heart of the Christian faith. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress. If that is true, then rather obviously there was a serious lack of true religion in the days of Elisha. No one came to the aid of this widow and her sons. Howard Hendricks explains that in that day, a woman without a husband was a woman without any means of material support. God had made a provision for that when he gave his people the law, but Invariably, when the people turned away from God, their apostasy allowed people to disregard the needs and rights of widows and orphans. And thus there was injustice in the days of Elisha, but that should never happen in the church. Every Christian ought to share God's heart for widows, and of course that includes all older single women in the church, and it includes all single parent mothers, everyone who is as needy as a widow. They are members of your own spiritual family, and thus such women are your sisters in Christ, and therefore they deserve your most careful attention and tender 
affection. Caring for widows begins in the biological family, and then it extends also to the spiritual family. If any woman who is a believer, and I am reading again from 1 Timothy chapter 5, which has so much to say about widows, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her family, she should help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. You see the pattern. First, the family, and then the church are God's chosen instruments for the care of the elderly and the needy. Christian families should care for their own widows and grandparents. And when this does not or for some reason cannot happen, then the church should step in to help. Deacons should be aware of the daily needs of the elderly women and especially widows under their care. And in the same way, the elders of the church must be aware of their spiritual needs. And yet, of course, caring for widows is not just for church officers. It is a ministry for the whole church. It is my observation that in many churches, the elderly are best cared for by older believers, and I suppose this may be appropriate given the affinities of age and experience. And yet caring for the old is also a job for the young. Every child and every young adult in the church should have a meaningful relationship with some senior citizen. Find out if there are any shut-ins in your neighborhood. The fact that some of our oldest members are unable to attend worship services which is, I can tell you, a great burden to them, does not diminish the church's spiritual and material responsibility for them. Quite the opposite. If a family member was sick or absent, we would long to visit them. And the same must be true within the family of God. And perhaps I might also mention that the Bible also has instructions for widows themselves. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. This again from 1 Timothy chapter 5. Like the widow whom Elisha helped, widows and older single women must be women of faith and prayer. They must ask and trust God to supply all their needs. And may I also say this, then they must be willing to be helped. If it is our biblical responsibility before God to help you, then it must also be your Christian responsibility to receive help. When a young Christian helps an older Christian, it is a sign of respect and honor, and therefore it should be received as a gift with gratitude and humility. God is glorified whenever the church shares his own love for widows. He is glorified when a church keeps a careful list of its widows and oldest members, as we read in the New Testament and as we also practice in this church. God is glorified when children participate in the nursing home ministry. He is glorified when people who are too old to drive are brought to church by a friend. He is glorified when churches continue to provide for missionaries in their retirement. Caring for widows and for other needy women, especially the elderly, is what being a Christian is about. And then there is this third lesson from the miracles of the jars of oil, and that is that God also cares for the fatherless. You may have noticed that nearly all the Bible passages which refer to widows, some of which we have read, also refer to orphans. Like widows, the fatherless are not to be abused or oppressed. God himself defends their cause. They are allowed to pick from the harvest the grapes and the grain. They are entitled to a portion of the tithe to take care of them like taking care of widows, is the essence of true religion. And this is because, like widows, the fatherless are among the neediest of the needy and therefore receive God's special favor. Scripture also teaches that God especially cares for the fatherless when they are also the children of the righteous. Righteous. 
And this is why the widow is careful to remind Elisha that her husband was a godly man. Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. What a wonderful way to be commemorated. The widow's praise serves as a fitting epitaph for this man. His name is not recorded in Scripture, and yet this we know, that he revered the Lord. He was not remembered as a nice guy, or a good father, or a devoted husband, or a gifted teacher, although he may have been many of those things. He was remembered for the whole reverential tenor of his life. Everything that he did conveyed a sense of the majesty of God. Many Christians are active in the church, and yet how many do we know who live in a way that is relentlessly reverent? The widow's point is that the children of such a man deserve to be well treated. They have a right to expect that God will meet their needs because God cares for the children of the righteous. So it is worth asking ourselves, what are we doing? What are you doing to care for the fatherless and particularly for the children of the righteous? Every believer should adopt an orphan or give money to evangelists working among the street children of South America or befriend the children of divorce as we know them in the church. Another way to care for the fatherless is through prayer. Whenever I hear of the death of a minister, and particularly of the martyrdom of some minister of the gospel, I pray for the man's children. I pray that they will not be bitter against God for what has happened to their father. I pray that God will meet all of their material needs. I pray that God will give them the gift of saving faith. And I can pray all of these things in faith, trusting in the promises of God, because on the basis of Elisha's miracle, we learn that God cares for the fatherless of the righteous. A wonderful story about God's care for the fatherless comes from the life of George Mueller. In 1835, Mueller established a home for orphans in Bristol, England, and since the orphanage was a faith mission, he experienced many wonderful answers to prayer. One morning he went down into the long dining room of the orphanage and As an eyewitness recounts, there was nothing on the table but empty dishes. There was no food in the larder and no money to supply the need. The children were standing, waiting for breakfast. Children, you know we must be in time for school, said Mueller. And then lifting his hand, he prayed, Dear Father, we thank Thee for what Thou art going to give us to eat. And a knock was then heard at the door, and the baker stood there. Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast, and the Lord wanted me to send you some, so I got up at 2 o'clock and baked some fresh bread and have brought it. Children, Mueller said, we not only have bread, but the rare treat of fresh bread. Almost immediately there came a second knock at the door. This time it was the milkman who announced that his milk cart had broken down outside the orphanage and that he would like to give the children his cans of fresh milk so that he could empty his wagon and repair it. You see, there are no orphans in the family of God because God is the heavenly loving Father who cares for everything his children need. It is perhaps noteworthy that the miracle of the jars of oil happened behind closed doors. This shows, by the way, how unchristian it is to broadcast the miraculous. God does not perform miracles to show off. As R.D. Patterson says, the command to fill the jars behind closed doors delivers the miracle from mere spectacle. It was a private need, privately met by a sovereign and loving God. And because it was a private affair, the miracle of the jars of oil is a story about a family learning to trust God's providence together. This is one of the first spiritual lessons that children are able to learn. 
that they have a heavenly Father who cares for them. And this widow's sons learned this lesson firsthand. They were the ones who helped go around and ask their neighbors for empty jars. And they were the ones who brought them one by one to their mother. And then they watched her fill them, every jar a lesson in the providence of God. And afterwards, whenever those boys needed help, they could look back to that miracle and they could say, remember that time that mom was about to sell us into slavery? Yeah, I remember the other one say it was a miracle she never did it. And as they happily recounted the famous event in their family history, they would remember that God cares for the fatherless and for all the needy. It is a wonderful thing to trust in God's providence as a family. Some of you may know that when we first moved to Philadelphia two years ago now, we began from the very beginning to pray for a house in the city. For two years we prayed nearly every day, and as some of you also know, those prayers have now been answered. And this coming Saturday we will move into a house just four or five blocks from the church. One of the wonderful things about that answer to prayer has been the possibility of sharing the answer as a family, and particularly the great privilege and joy of hearing my own son now day after day as we thank God for the house, even as we prayed to God for the house. A family that prays together in this way learns God's providence together. And there is just one more thing to notice about this Miracle, and that is that Elisha's ministry is starting to seem very similar to Elijah's. I wonder if anyone has noticed that. He performs the same kind of miracles Elijah used to perform. Both prophets parted the Jordan River and both brought water to a thirsty land and both now performed a miracle in oil for a destitute widow. Ministries of the two prophets are not identical, but they are similar. And part of the point is that Elisha is a true prophet. Each time he performs a miracle, we are reminded that he is an authentic prophet. Elisha can do everything that Elijah did and more. Thus the great Scottish minister William Still suggests that the relationship between Elijah and Elisha teaches us about the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. You may know that in the New Testament, John the Baptist is described as the Elijah who was to come. And if Elijah represents John the Baptist, and if John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, then it is worth asking whether Elisha might not represent the Christ. The story of the jars of oil does point us to the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is not just about providence It is also about redemption. As the children told me when I met with them to talk about this story, the danger that the widow's sons face at the beginning of the story is not starvation. Although the widow is almost out of oil, the danger they face is slavery. The widow cried out, My husband is dead and his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. And then at the end of the story, the great deliverance is that these sons are bought back from slavery. Elisha says, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. The widow sells the oil instead of her sons. And significantly, the word used for that transaction is recompense, which is a suitable word to use for a story of redemption. Throughout the whole Old Testament, God demonstrates that he has power to bring freedom to his people. The great saving act of the Old Testament is the deliverance from slavery in Egypt. That exodus shows us the pattern of salvation. And what salvation means, in part, is freedom from slavery. Therefore, one of the great promises of the Old Testament is that the Messiah will liberate the captives In the day of salvation, I will say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. And In the New Testament, we learn, as many of us know from our own experience, that the worst of all slaveries is the slavery to sin. In the letter to the Galatians, we read that when we were children, 
We were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. In other words, we were slaves to the world and its values, slaves to sin, slaves even to the devil. And yet God has not left us in our slavery. As Galatians goes on to say, when the time had fully come, God sent His Son to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. And thus we are no longer slaves, but in Christ we have become God's sons and daughters. By faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we receive the same thing that these sons in the story of the miracle of the jars of oil received, freedom from slavery and the right to remain in the family. Through Christ, God has bought us back from slavery and He has made us His own sons and daughters. And in doing so, He cares for everything that we need. Amen, and let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise for your providence. We give you praise that our testimony is on this morning that you take care of everything that we need. And we bring before you in our hearts some of those needs which burden us at the moment. We commit them to you and we trust you to provide what we need. And we give you praise also that we can make this request coming as your own children bought back from slavery through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to Every Last Word, a ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, featuring the Bible teaching of Dr. Philip Graham Ryken. We appreciate your ongoing support of this broadcast ministry. The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades, even centuries gone by, we seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. The Alliance also produces the radio broadcasts The Bible Study Hour, featuring the teaching of the late Dr. James Montgomery Boyce and Dr. Barnhouse in the Bible, featuring the Bible teaching of the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. For a full list of radio stations carrying our programs, please visit our website at www.alliancenet.org. Every last word continues through your generous gifts and financial support. If you would like to see this program continue to benefit others as it has benefited you, please prayerfully consider becoming a friend of the Alliance. For more information or to make a contribution, please contact us by calling toll-free 1-800-488-1888. You can also send us a gift by writing to Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at www.alliancenet.org. Be sure to ask for a free resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to Every Last Word.